Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's nice to meet you all. I am a little bit excited, actually. <laughs> um, so I'll start by uh, introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Nitan Gado. I have a bachelor's in computer science and linguistics and um, a master's in computer science. Um, I've been a data scientist um, for the last five years uh, doing uh, NLP and I am also extremely uh, enthusiastic about um, languages and, um, and natural language processing. Um, I'm working um, for, uh, for an American global company uh, called Intuit. Intuit is a company that has different um, financial software uh, that help people worldwide do their taxes, work with their businesses, promote their businesses, and so on. The company has um, millions of customers um, worldwide. Um, and I'm a part of a team that works on NLP and focuses on, um, um, on NLP and specifically on language models. Um, and other than that, I get to be um, a WEEDS Tel Aviv ambassador. And um, so it's really nice to meet you all. And to say a few words on why I am here, this is definitely the slide in my presentation that will have uh, the least new information for all of you, because we all know that around six months ago, something happened that really changed the way um, we are um, interacting, talking, and what we're talking about and everything, which is the release of ChatGPT. So ever since ChatGPT was released, basically, everybody's losing their mind. Um, and to be more specific, um, wherever we look, um, wherever we go, wherever we scroll, we see uh, people talking about their interactions um, with ChatGPT, posting their interaction. Um, it, it got to a um, million users in record time compared to other, um, to other um, um, applications. Um, we know that um, like crazy things are happening, like Sam, Sam Altman, um, CEO of OpenAI, went to the Congress, spoke about these innovations and how they're going to influence us. Um, and we know that um, things that like uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who is considered one of the godfathers of AI, um, uh, retired from Google um, and talks about the dangers in generative AI. So basically, a lot is going on. Um, and the, the goal of my talk today is to talk a little bit on how we got to where we are, um, where we are kind of right now, um, and um, at the end we will have a short discussion. Um, so before I say uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand during the talk, and eventually um, at the end I hope we'll have a few minutes for questions. So if you will ask a question in the middle that I will want to answer on at the end, I will just say that. Are you alive? Like some kind of a... <laughs> okay. Um, so we will try to answer those questions. What is going on? How did we get here? And what can we expect next during the last um, 45 minutes? So what are we going to talk about in the session? So at the beginning, I will try to convince you that language is extremely exciting. It's an amazing phenomenon. After it, we will talk a little bit about language modeling. Um, what is language modeling? Why do we want to model language? And how it is done? And um, after it, we will talk a little bit about uh, large language models. And at the end, we will have some questions and discussions. Just to give a short disclaimer about this entire talk. So um, a lot is going on. Like There are new models released on a daily basis. So. Um, Especially the third part of my um, of my talk will include like several points that I think are worth knowing in this field, but it's not going to be everything. So in the discussion phase, if you want to add something that um, you heard of or something like that, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, so let's start. Um, so this is the definition of, of language as taken from um, the first paragraph of Wikipedia. Very easy. But if we want to go over it, let's start. So language is a structured system of communication that consists of grammar and vocabulary. It is the primary means by which um, 
uh, by which humans convey meaning both in spoken and written forms and may also be conveyed through sign languages. The vast majority of human languages have developed writing systems uh, that allow for the recording and preservation of the sounds um, or signs of language. So, so far so good. I think this part of the definition doesn't uh, is not news to us and now we're gonna like skip a little bit and get to this last part so human languages possess the properties of productivity and displacement which enable the creation of an infinite number of sentences and the ability to refer to objects events and ideas that are not immediately present in the discourse so before we move on, any people in the audience who work with languages or are linguistic or are linguists or Yes, I saw some hand there. <laughs> okay, so um, this sentence is a, li is a bit less clear, right? But we are talking here about two interesting, um, two, um, interesting properties of language, which are productivity and displacement. So what are those uh, properties? So productivity is the limitless ability to use language, um, any natural language, to say new things. So for example, I'm, um, I'm a native Hebrew speaker. Um, but I, I think, I assume a lot of you here are um, native uh, Portuguese speakers. And if I will now ask you, or even if I don't ask you, because you probably do that every day, you will invent new um, sentences in your language, which is Portuguese. You, you are able to invent um, new sentences you have never heard before. And if we think of it, this is an extremely amazing capability. More than that, if um, we will now invent something new or something, or we'll see something we have never seen before, um, so we will, um, we will be able to name it in a name that is related to our language and to the way we um, think of language. And this is extremely uh, amazing because we can keep on inventing and adding new things to our language as we go on. Um, the second property, displacement, is the ability to refer to objects, events, and ideas that are not immediately present in the discourse. So, I have never been to Spain, which is something we discussed yesterday, and I have to change uh, <laughs> soon, but right now I have never been to Spain. But still, I think I can kind of speak of Spain, like I can talk about how I imagine it, I can talk about what I think they do out there, and I can in general talk about things I have never seen, and I can even talk about things that no one has ever seen, so I haven't even heard of them. And these two properties are extremely, extremely amazing, and in my opinion, they are, um, they are what's making uh, human language so amazing. Um, Okay, so um, the next question some of you might ask is, okay, so language is a pretty amazing thing, but the nature, nature um, in its whole is an amazing thing. And is this something that is um, unique to the humankind? So here in, the, in this slide, I think it's my favorite slide in the presentation. Maybe the last one will be better. I'll, we will uh, talk about it later. Um, these are three examples of animals that have some kind of extremely um, impressive um, language capabilities. Um, one of them is a dolphin, the other is a bonobo ape, and the third is, how not, a border collie. And all of them have some kind of uh, way in which they can commu communicate with humans. They can make sentences or they can um, identify um, toys by the name. By the way, this uh, dog chaser, he could identify um, over 1,000 um, toys by the name and fetch them by name, um, which is extremely amazing. But from what we know, um, there is no other um, species on Earth that communicates the way humans do. And for this reason, I hope that by this time in the talk, we are all convinced that language is an extremely amazing phenomena and is highly related to how intelligent um, people are. It is even um, it is even thought to be related to the fact that humans managed to create societies and um, economics and all kinds of um, those things that brought progress. Um, so now that we talked about how language is exciting, let's talk a little bit about language modeling. So um, 
In language modeling, we are taking our language, our extremely amazing um, thing that we just spoke of, and we model it in order to be able to do things algorithmically with it. And why would we want to do that? Because um, for the last decades, people want, wanted to take those, to this, these are just like several examples of tasks in natural language processing, but people wanted to be able to solve language related problems um, in an automated way and by computers. And for this reason, language modeling is something that we want to be able to do. So um, to talk a little bit about what language models are. So language models are a probability distribution over sequences of words, which we can call sentences, paragraphs, documents. Um, and given any sequence of words of length m, like sentence, paragraph, or document, a language model will assign a probability to the whole sequence. Um, language models generate probabilities by training on text corpora in one or many languages. So if I will have a language model, a good one, I will be able to take um, sentences in my language and assign a probability to them. Are they, do they make sense? Do they not? And the way to do it is to take a huge amount of text and learn from it, how does this language look like? So this is what um, we are doing when we are modeling language. And um, the topic of language modeling, since there was a lot of motivation to do that, has been researched um, a lot um, throughout the last century, or here we see 75 uh, years back. And there have been a lot of advancements uh, during those years, a lot of research that was done and a lot of amazing results um, that were existing in all of these, I think, um, points in time. Um, I want us now to talk just about a little bit of them to get to where we are today. Um, before we move on, any questions? Okay. Um, so um, the beginning or, um, or one of the um, um, oldest ways we know of modeling language are n-gram models. So in n-gram models, we are trying to assign a probability to our sequence. The way we do it is that we take our entire sentence, we break it into um, pieces of size m, and then we look at the probability of each n-sized piece. And to show an example, so here we have the sentence. Let's see if the laser, oh, it works. It is great to attend J Nation. So we can divide it into groups of two, uh, of two words. So we have the word it that appears after the beginning of the sentence. Then we have the word is that appears after the, um, the word it. Great after is and so on. For each one of those pairs, we can assign a probability. How can we assign a probability? So we can look at our huge corpus that we took at the beginning to create our language model. We can count. Let's see how many times does the word um, it appears now. Let's see how many times it appears after the beginning of the sentence, after the start. So this way we will have a set of probabilities. We can multiply all these probabilities and get a number. Um, so this is the way it is done. You can already see from, um, from the example we see here is that we have this simplifying assumption that might be a little bit problematic, right? Because I'm looking here at the possibility of it being at the start of the sentence and I'm looking at is being after it, but I'm lo not looking at the possibility of J nation appearing after, like appearing in the sixth place after the beginning of the sentence, right? This is not something I'm looking at here. And this is because this is um, a bigram uh, model. We can look, we can increase n, and then um, we can get more information, but this will also create some problems. So first of all, as we move on to um, larger n's, we will have much more probabilities we will have to count. And this becomes pretty big. Right, like I'm going to have to look at all the possible thirds of words in a language. That's a lot. Uh, it's not even something we're sure we can map, right? Um, and the other part is zero probabilities. Um, so as we said before, we can generate new sentences. 
Um, and those sentences might get probability zero because maybe we have never seen this in our training data. And we are um, and we are trying to assign a probability to a new sentence. So these two problems have several solutions, but there are um, issues that um, are limitations of this model. Okay, so to the rescue came um, neural network language models. So in neural network language models, we are trying to do in this um, feedforward uh, um, language model, we are trying to assign the same the prob a probability to a sequence of words. So as you can see here, we are taking this th uh, th these three words, we are adding it to our um, to our um, sorry, we are forwarding it through our neural network. We are uh, starting by representing our words in a vectorial representation, moving on to a hidden layer, and eventually we are getting a probability using some kind of a softmax um, layer. So this solves the the problem in a way that's like instead of looking at just specific thirds of words we are taking um, we are creating a function that just has more values to give and this solves the can solve the problem um, the curse of dimensionality and the the uh, the problem um, of zero um, of zero properties uh, probabilities sorry um, yet Sorry. Yet those um, network uh, those networks still had some issues, right? Like we are still discarding this beginning of the sentence as we are looking at just a uh, like a triplet of words or just four words. To the rescue for this problem came um, solutions like recurrent neural networks. So what we do in recurrent neural networks, it might seem the the graph might seem a bit complicated, but let's think of it. When I when I'm standing here talking to you, you remember what I said one sentence ago. You remember what I said five words ago. We want to make our model able to know what uh, what uh, we said. Um, 10 words ago, or 5 words ago, or 50 words ago. And the way it is done with recurrent neural network is by saving some kind of a state. When we have the state, we train the model on the first word of the sentence. We are getting an output, and the output also includes a hidden state. Then we're, when we are looking at the second word, we are also giving the hidden state, and so on. Like at each point of training our model, we are also getting a hidden state that allows us to remember some of what we have seen before. Um, so this was good, but still had several problems. So the first problem we have with neural networks in general, and specifically um, for RNNs, is exploding or vanishing gradients. So what happens when we are working with neural networks is that we are taking a vector and we are multiplying it over and over and over again with other vectors. So what can happen if we have a very large number or a very small number is that we will multiply by the large number and our, um, our um, result will become bigger and bigger. This can bring us to a state where if we have a big number, it can just um, like control over everything, and we won't be able to, uh, and we won't be able um, to get the essence of what we want. Other than that, we can also have some problems of numeric stability, right? If we are um, if we are multiplying, but by very large numbers, we can just have our um, our um, results as zero. But this is a problem we can also save. Uh, we can also solve in a different way. Um, Secondly, these models were not um, very good at long-term dependency of words. So as I said right now, I hope that if I will ask some of you, we'll be able to say something I said like five minutes ago. But RNN models, um, while they were grew larger and larger, were still not able to capture the meaning between um, like from far apart in the sentence or in the text. So this is another problem. And the, the third problem was training time. Because we are training, and then we're getting the hidden state, and we continue our training, and so on. And we have to wait each time for the entire calculation to be done to get the hidden state, and then move on to the next, um, 
to the next um, uh, words in the sequence. So these were all issues with RNNs. I will say that there were several other architectures that um, were um, vastly used for language models, like um, GRUs and, R and LSTM, but I will not talk about those now to save some time and to talk about other things. Um, one more thing that I want to say about um, when talking about uh, neural representations of language modeling, I feel that uh, I feel obligated to talk about word to vec So word to vec um, is a method in which um, basically what is done is that after we are training a language model, after we are training um, a neural network for language, we are taking a layer, the layer before the last layer of the of the network. So it sounds pretty complicated, but let's say I want to use a neural network to say if a, co if, uh, a comment about a movie is positive or negative. I'm learning this problem with a model of neural networks. And instead of taking the response, I'm just going to take the last um, I'm just going to take the last um, layer before the layer that gives responses. So I will get basically vectors. And it, is, it was shown that those vectors have a very interesting quality. They show, um, they give similar uh, representations, closer representations, to words that can appear in similar contexts. So for example, the words for um, shirt and the words for pants will be probably closer than the words for shirt and the words for truck. So this is something that was shown to have very, th this is something that really um, gave good results. And these um, vectors can be used in, in plenty of ways. Um, and also, it started a track of working on um, just vectorial representations of um, language for uh, a lot of, uh, for a lot of, um, um, problems, um, and this is like an, an entire new track. This is an, an entirely other um, track of uh, work um, in NLP. Um, and so, for the um, last um, architecture, we are going to talk about. Um, so, in 2017, um, um, the transformers um, were published. Um, so the idea for transformers is that they use a, a new mechanism uh, within them. This mechanism is called self-attention. So just to to give a bit a bit sense, so um, self-attention is another way to use attention mechanism, and attention mechanism existed before. So oh, sorry, attention mechanism existed before. It was just not used in this way. So. Um, transformers have um, several um, ways of work. So the first one is that we have encoder-only models. Encoder models can get words, can get sentences, can get documents, and give back vectors. Um, similar to those vectors we spoke about before, embedding, um, embedding vectors. They can be used to create classifiers and to solve classification problems. The second type are decoder-only models. They are good um, for generative tasks, um, such as text generation. They can get either nothing or some kind of a previous output and generate text. And the third are encoder-decoder models. They are best for sequence-to-sequence -sequence problems like translation, summarization, those kind of things. These get um, text and bring back and give back text as output. So as I said, attention um, was introduced um, in two th around 2014 to improve sequence-to-sequence um, -sequence models. Um, and transformers were introduced in 2017 in this paper um, with the headline of attention is all you need, um, where this um, paper just took this mechanism of attention and used it broadly. So I know um, I'm saying a lot the word attention, and we're not going to go into the details. But just to give a small understanding of what attention, of what self-attention does. So 
when we spoke from the beginning of looking at language modeling, we were talking about the fact that we want to be able to grasp the context of the sentence. We want to be able to understand, if we're looking at an entire documentation, that the person that we are talking about at the beginning, at the first sentence, is the same one as the one we're talking about at the third paragraph or at the second sentence, and so on. So this is something that, as humans, we are doing without even noticing. Um, but it is very hard to teach computers to do that. So what the attention mechanism does is that essentially it creates a vector for each word that um, allows it to, um, to understand to which words these words might be connected to the most. So for example, if we're looking at this sentence, um, the, the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So to us, it is very clear that the word it refers to the animal, right? Although, if we are looking at the syntax of the language, it can also be related to the street, right? Because it can either refer to an animal or it can refer to the street. But when we have a tension mechanism, we can have a vector that will give a higher uh, higher scores to the animal rather than the other words in the um, um, in the sentence. Um, so this is why this is um, almost, I think, magical. Um, and so these are transformers. And now that we got to talk about transformers, we can start talking about large language models. And the reason for that is that generative models or large language models um, are transformers. So large language models doesn't have to be generative models, right? They can also be like really large encoders. But as people talk about large language models today, they usually refer to those language that to those sorry language models that are um, capable of creating um, of generating. Um, text. So usually when we are talking about large language models, we will talk about either decoder-only models or on encoder-decoder models uh, or on encoder-decoder models. So several advantages of those models. So first of all, we have the attention mechanism, which is, as we said, um, magic, and it allows to um, under, to encode the context, even when words or sentences are far apart. Um, it is, I think it's kind of like as good as the machine you have at this point. Like if you have a very strong machine, you can even encode um, words with contexts of hundreds of words between them. Um, other than that, um, the pro the pro processing of all the words um, is done in parallel, which speeds up the computation. Um, also, the distance between the words does not matter. This is also related to the attention mechanism. And it's just like another reason is just that they are very, very good models. These models are very strong and they're highly accurate on a lot of tasks. Um, so a little bit on how those uh, models are trained, right? Because when we looked at the Ngram model at the beginning, I was kind of like, teaching how to train it, right? I was saying like, yeah, you can take just a lot of text, you can count, and then you will have the probabilities. But here we are trying to train a model that is a neural network. And neural networks need to have some kind of a task. They're going to try and be successful at this task. And if they're not successful, they're going to correct themselves um, by, changing, um, by changing their parameters. So the way it is done is just, is just taking huge amounts of data, like real huge amounts of data, and um, just um, invent a task over it. So this task can either be just take a sentence and, um, and um, delete a word from it and see if it manages to, uh, if the model manages to, um, um, to guess what this word is. Or it can be, in the case that we see here, just um, next uh, word prediction, next token prediction. So our model here gets my, then it, it has to return name, and then it gets my name, and then it has to return is, and then it has to return Sylvain, and so on. So we are taking like huge amounts of data, and we are um, t teaching the model to predict the next um, word. 
Um, so a little bit more on how are they, they are trained. So it can be trained to just capture a uh, language, but also when we are looking at models like um, ChatGPT or others, they're also capable of solving instructions. So the capability of solving instructions existed before in language models. For example, in GPT-3, it was already seen that if you are like taking GPT-3 as is, and you are like gonna write like some kind of a mathematical, um, like something easy of like first grade, like five plus seven equals. So it's gonna say five plus seven, twelve. <laughs> and um, so it was able of doing that because it learned like from a lot of data. But in order to make them very, very good. Um, also, some calibration was required on instruction data. So a lot of instructions were created and it was trained on those as well. And another um, thing that is crucial for the help for, for how good those models are is just to try and understand are they good. So like a lot of other tasks, almost all of the tasks in machine learning, here as well we need some tag data. So this tag data is, um, is um, um, collected and what is done it's called reinforcement learning from human feedback where we take the human feedback and we keep on um, training our model with that feedback. Um, another thing um, that we should know about transformers is that they are big. <laughs> How big? Very big. So not for all transformers we know what their size is. For example, for ChatGPT, we don't know. There are like rumors, but it was not published. Um, but we can see here, so um, BERT uh, is a very well-known encoder transformer um, uh, that was created in 2018 by Google and was considered state-of-the-art for, um, for a lot of tasks for a long time. It was 0.34 billion parameters. And if we are looking already at things that we had in 2021, we see that Switch Transformer by Google was already 1.6 um, um, trillion parameters. Um, there are some other models that were released um, lately. So Llama by uh, Meta that was released and can be trained has like a set of models between 7 billion and 65 billion parameters. Alpaca um, is a 7 billion language model. It was fine-tuned on Llama uh, using instruction data. Um, and Vicuña um, is a 13 billion um, is a 13 billion parameter model, uh, which was trained um, based on Share GPT, which, ju which is just a website in which people share their interactions with ChatGPT. So it was thank you. So it was used. Um, so it was used um, to improve. So these are all models that was that were released in the. Um, last I think four months, five months. Um, and it's quite, an ama it's quite amazing to see how um, fast this is going and how hard everybody's working on that. Um, and to know where to find those transformers. Um, so um, Hugging Face is a website that uh, hosts a lot of um, things that are highly uh, productive for machine learning, but it also has transformers in it. And transformers is just a library and a hub in which a lot of models are hosted. So if you are um, interested, you can just go there and see a lot of, um, a lot of models available, um, a lot of transformers available, and you can also train your own model and make it available through Hugging Face to other developers to use. Um, so, um, a little bit about fine-tuning. Um, so we might have, um, like I might want to create my own large language models for my own purpose. Um, and I can do that, but it would be not very, um, um, it won't be, very, it won't make a lot of sense to do it from the beginning, right? I don't want to do it from scratch because someone else, like uh, like Meta or Google or some other huge company that has more resources that that I Nissan have, uh, already took um, already took a lot of the internet and trained the model. So what we can do is we can just fine tune a model, which means we are taking the model, we are taking everything it already learned, and we start from there with our new task. So this is something that we can do. It is still pretty hard to do because 
the models, as we said, are large. So in order to fine tune a model, we don't need to learn everything from the internet from the beginning, but we do need to be able to hold this model in our memory and to, um, to create some calculations on it and to save it. And this might take a lot of time and will require some pretty um, heavy duty hardware. And also, um, when we are training on a new task, we, are, we can accidentally make the model forget other things, other things that it learned. So these are two things uh, we need to consider when fine-tuning a model. I will say that there is a lot of work currently going on in the field of how to fine-tune those models, and like hardware is improved all the time, as well as the framework for training. So there are currently all kinds of solutions that enable you to train with less um, compute power. Um, a few more words about evaluating large language models. So I was like, up to, up to this point, ever since we started talking about large language models, we were like, OK, so large language models are amazing. But how amazing are they really? So um, I believe all of you have tried out like ChatGPT and have some sense of how good it is. But if we get like a general large language model, how can we see how good it is? So there are all kinds of ways in which evaluation is done. So uh, here this image is taken from a leaderboard um, hosted by, um, by Hugging Face Transformers. And in this leaderboard, they are evaluating the models with specific tasks. So every model that um, is trained can be uh, measured um, with those um, tasks and be added to the um, to the leaderboard if it's better than others, not better than others. These are usually um, just um, uh, multiple choice questions, some reasoning tasks, some uh, mathematical um, questions, and so on. Um, other than that, um, here this is taken from uh, from an OpenAI paper talking about how they are doing some kinds of uh, manual annotations of their um, outputs. So you can see that they are looking into all kinds of things. So we have the overall quality. We have does it uh, follow the correct instruction of task? Does it hallucinate? Which we know it's a very big problem with these models. They just make up stuff <laughs> like we do, but. Um, they just make up stuff and people really trust them. Um, does it contain all kinds of harmful content of several kinds? So this is um, another thing um, that we see in research. And another thing that is very interesting is to see that you can evaluate large language models using other large language models, which means I can build my own language model and I can um, take the, the response I got from my language model, send it to another language model and ask, is this a high quality response for this question? And to get um, answers. So I can either ask, is this high quality? Or I can also just ask, does it contain harmful content? Is this correct? Does it contain, um, does it express its opinion? And so forth. Um, so these are taken from uh, this. This, as I said, is taken from an OpenAI paper, and uh, this um, this thing of evaluating large language models um, using other large language models is something you can see in the Vicuña model. Um, okay, so. Um, this is where it stands um, in what I wanted to say about large language models. I know it was a, a bit of everything, but this is kind of uh, how things are as I see it at this point. And the last uh, 10 minutes that we have, um, I wanted us to do some kind of questions or discussions. So what I was thinking is that like, I can, I can stand here and say my opinion on where we are going and what we'll be able to see. And I think that from a technical stand of point, like, it can definitely be done. Uh, but I think that this uh, discussion is much broader than just um, than just talking about what will be what we will be technically able to do, uh, and so I wanted to ask if you have any questions or any things you want to um, bring up for discussion. Yes. Um, okay, so I think, um, first of all, I will repeat the question. 
So what is your name? Bruno? So um, Bruno uh, was asking about hallucinations. He said that from everything we saw, this looks like the hardest problem to solve. And do I think this is something that can be solved? So um, um, a bit around your question, I will say that large language models, other than um, other than being amazing, they are also pretty hard to explain. So for all kinds of machine learning models, we have all kinds of ways to explain why this model was, um, why this model chose what it chose or answered as it answered. For la large language models, this uh, problem is not considered solved as far as I know, although there are some works in which one model is trying to explain the other. <laughs> and um, But this is still something that is really uh, starting to happen. So when a model um, hallucinates, um, it might look very convincing. It might it actually uh, often seems very convincing. Like I saw an um, I saw um, like uh, an article last week about um, a lawyer that came to court and talked about uh, things that never happened in front of the judge, and the judge was like, "This never happened in a court," and he was like, "Oh, but ChatGPT said that it did," um, and he was kicked out of the court. This is what they said in the article. I wasn't there. Um, but um, so I agree that this is an extremely hard problem. I don't. I don't think I have like a specific solution. I think that what um, what we can do in cases in which we want to be able to understand why the model chose as it is, and you can already do that with several models, is like if you want to be able to I don't know create a summary for a specific paper, and so you can just give the model the paper and say, okay, please create a summary, and please also like. Share with me the explanation of how you created this summary. And then you can get an explanation that you can read and you can have some kind of understanding, is it good or not? But this is like in an assumption where you are like talking to the model and you know exactly what it wants to do and everything. And of course, this assumption won't hold if we are talking of massive usage of those models. So I'm not sure how this problem is going to be solved. I think that asking for reasoning from the model would be one thing, maybe, um, connecting the models to like um, some sort of closed um, data sets and then asking them to explain um, um, which place in the data set this was taken from and so on. I think these are like solutions I know some people already work on and I assume that there is much more work that is already been done and to be done uh, moving forward. Any other questions? Yes. So I think um, if I'm talking specifically about transformers and I'm not talking about the, the other part of your question, so I think that transformer is a combination. First of all, it's a very smart architecture, right? Like instead of looking at just a specific word, trying to understand or just a specific set of words, it looks at the entire sequence and creates some kind of um, some kind of an, an encoding for a large sequence, which is something it, we, it was hard to do before. So this is first. Other than that, transformers are amazing, but it's not just transformers transformers that have been improving across the last decade. It's also compute powers. So if we, it used to be like, I remember in 2018 when Belt was just released, I was trying to make Belt walk in production and I was like, this is very hard. <laughs> I don't understand if I'm on GPU, not on GPU, do I have a GPU for production or just for training and so on. Now it is very easy. Um, we have more software written to do it and as well as more hardware to run it on. So I think it's a combination of my, what made transformers um, this strong. I also, th I also uh, think that in the last 10 years there are a lot of um, companies in the industry that have been working on that. Where like there were some, I saw this, I uh, we saw this timeline before. There were like some um, spaces on this timeline in which um, natural language process the processing was mostly done in the academia. And this is ob obviously, of course, another difference. And as to are we, um, are we um, about to understand human intelligence? Was that the question? So I'm not sure if, um, if the models will be able to understand human intelligent, I intelligence, but I do think we are pretty close to a point in which they will be able to mimic it. Um, 
So I'm, I'm not sure, like, this is a question of, like, what understanding means and what is language and how is language related to our uh, intelligence. But to my personal opinion, and I think it was uh, clear from the beginning, I believe that um, our um, ability to use language um, is highly related with our intelligence. So I hope that answers. Oh. Any other questions? No? Yes? Uh, sorry, I couldn't see. <laughs> Uh, what are the limitations of the current iteration of transformers? What problems are we trying to solve that we cannot with the current architecture? So, um, first of all, I think that um, what we saw in this slide are like this is some kind of um, an evaluation um, that was done, like um, collected metadata. So, I think all those things can be like current issues with tra with transformers. I think. Um, I think that hallucinations is a huge problem. I think that like um, how to make them safe is another very interesting um, uh, like part. Like even if we are assuming that those transformers released by large companies will be released in a safe way and will be guarded in a good way, um, the like open source community and probably some other not as nice communities are moving towards having their own very strong models. So I think this is going to be a huge challenge. Um, and what can be done in those uh, in those things? I think that like first of all, it's like evaluate and measure on that. And second of all, I think from like the I'm gonna add like the human perspective, like not to trust whatever we see, like to be like a little bit of a li to have a, a bit of healthy um, skepticism and like to try and understand like um, how things work. But definitely, I think it's gonna be a huge challenge. Any other questions? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. Oh, you asked about tools to do evaluations. Yes. Okay. So the Transformers uh, library offers um, like some um, scripts to train your own uh, models. So you can take like data and you can do the, the training. And then as you are running the script, you can also use all kinds of available evaluations to evaluate your model. So these will be like all kinds of automatic evaluations, like the ones we see here. So these are like questions. They have a right answer. And you can say, OK, does my model get it right? Yes or no? Um, so this is um, this is one way, but usually if you are looking to create your own um, your own model for your own purpose, um, it is something that you need to consider to create your own evaluations, right? Because you're going to have a problem that is not the general problem that you see here, and you're going to have your own requirements. Like if you are in a company um, that has like uh, that that puts I don't know honesty first, you would want like hallucinations rates to be zero before this can go or like it's just an example of course it can never be zero but you want it to be very low so these are the kind of things i think we're going to see in advance actually yesterday uh, sam altman who is the ceo of OpenAI, um he was hosted in uh, tel aviv in tel aviv university and what, one of the things he said is that like evaluating those models is still like a huge like open question and problem that he's going to see uh people working on probably throughout the next years uh, maybe last question? No, time out. Okay. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>